My name is Scott Tucker. Since 2004, I have traveled the globe in search of adventure, culture, and wildlife. And after producing 100 short documentaries and broadcasting them across the entire U.S., it's finally dawned on me. This must be too good for mainstream media. I don't take vacations. This is not a hobby. We are totally out of the box. You think I'm crazy? I say you've lost your mind. You're living in a box wrapped up by fear. And it's sucking the life out of you. You're worried about being pampered and lying in the sun. That's not travel. That's not adventure. It's a living death. Open up your box and come with me. No matter where you go on this big blue marble, the first step is to take a look at the CDC website and identify the diseases you're up against when you get there. In this particular case, typhoid was number one, but even more important was what am I going to do about malaria? Mosquitoes carry malaria, and I'm going to be smack dab in the middle of mosquito territory. They said they'd give me mosquito netting. As long as I took the medication, which as it turned out, only cost five dollars, not a hundred if you were paying attention, everything was going to be fine. The second step with my type of travel adventure is only choose places where everybody tells you not to go. In this particular case, Papua New Guinea, or as I like to pronounce it, Papua New Guinea. They said there's no tourism infrastructure. The place is raw with chances of getting ripped off. With all that stuff playing in my mind, I stepped off the plane in my day and prepared to meet my first connection for the trip. And nobody was there. Not a single soul knew who I was. I started to panic. We've all seen the stereotypical thing play out where you finally get your luggage and you get to the end of the line at the airport and there's somebody there waiting for you with a sign with your name on it Mr. Tucker there was nothing nobody was there people were just looking at me finally a security guard came up and said excuse me sir can I help you After what felt like an eternity of trying to find someone who knew me, finally a driver said, I got him. And I jumped into a vehicle and away we went. I was back in business with a place to stay for the next two nights. But where the hell were they taking me? I went to my room and passed out woke up in the middle of the night. There's no way in hell I can sleep. It's like 12 noon to me, but it's actually about three in the morning here. What's strange is here in Madang, Papua New Guinea, before we get out into the bush, I figured, okay, I'm in a hotel. Let me get out in the middle of the night. Let me take a look and see what's happening. Virtually nothing. We're on the coast, and that's always challenging. But there's nothing, not an insect, not a lizard, not a gecko, nothing. A couple of fishermen down there, over by the barbed wire. I just saw lightning. It's so hot, you can cut it with a knife. Finally, something is alive. It's a crustacean, a land crab, trying to run for cover. You can see where he just urinated all over the place. Always hate to do that, but you can't get a close up look unless you grab him sometimes. 
Something's ticking off in the distance. I can hear thunder in the di distance. You can see lightning flashes as well. <laughs> As you can imagine, I'm still delirious at this point. So when I look off into the lawn and I see these amazing mollusks crawling around in the grass, I'm instantly drawn in like a magnet. But let's face it, I didn't travel nearly 10,000 miles to see snails and toads. I'm looking for something more extraordinary and I got what I wanted. I finally woke up, went out for a cup of coffee, and look who's there to join me, this amazing hornbill. Picking away at the fruits and the seeds right there. And then perhaps the most bittersweet moment of the trip, to see these amazing tree kangaroos kept in a small cage. It was just disheartening. I know I sound like a broken record, but here again, another species of mammal that is critically endangered in Papua New Guinea. They are decimated by hunting practices, loss of habitat. As more and more people start to dig in and try to exploit the resources. They survive predominantly on a vegetarian diet, supplemented with insects and nuts and whatnot. But either way, it broke my heart looking at these guys in a cage. In what seems like a blink of an eye, I track down a lead tells me he knows where we can find a population of the biggest bat in the world. Cars are driving by, people are walking around as if nothing's happening. And above me is a population of at least a hundred flying foxes. The biggest bat in the world. Nobody even paying any attention to him. with a wingspan of more than a meter in length. These guys are nothing to really worry about. They're fruit bats. They don't suck blood. Bats are pollinating our fruits. We've got to protect them. Just Did like the bees. people like to eat them? Yes. But they, you yeah. don't like to eat them because why? Uh, the face look like dogs. <laughs> and I love dogs. <laughs> uh, who needs a bat? knowing that I've only got a day before we head out into the bush. He runs me on another adventure to the Balik Wildlife Sanctuary, where there are these amazing sulfur springs loaded with crazy aquatic creatures like these. Try to get your mind around this. 99% of all the wildlife in Papua New Guinea is viewed as just about one thing. Food. That's all. Food. They don't really care about protecting and preserving in general. So when you find a nature preserve like this, and you find people that are talking about protection and thinking long term, this is a really big step. And it's very encouraging for the possibility of future ecotourism. To further complicate matters, there are over 800 tribal languages spoken in Papua New Guinea. Imagine the nightmare of trying to communicate from one tribe to another. The wildlife and the environment is really the one at risk here. The next thing you know, I'm driven down the road, we pull in to a butterfly sanctuary. This one was dedicated to raising fruities. Look at this thing. It's something out of a science fiction movie with all of these false barbs that are designed to try to protect it from potential predators. And just moments away from the butterfly garden is this amazing coastal village in Mandang. They're sustaining themselves with fishing. Check it out. Can I see? Eventually, I found myself eye to eye with the strangest mammal 
that I had ever seen in my life. A juvenile female spotted couscous. These guys are marsupials. In fact, they are a type of possum. <laughs> One marsupial back in New England, which is called an opossum, but this guy is extremely skittish. <laughs> That's okay, you can have it. You're so beautiful, you can have it. <laughs> and like I said before, everything that moves is oh eaten my. or somehow consumed. So the fact that the chief of this tribe decided to listen to my guide and hold these things captive so people like me could come and see them is nothing short of a miracle. The fun and games are over. It's time to put on my big boy pants. I jump in a bush plane, and we head a hundred miles even further into remote areas of Papua New Guinea, where I'm going to spend the next four days and four nights traveling with the natives of the Kalam tribe. don't take vacations. After all, the word vacation has the Latin root vacare, which means to be unoccupied. I don't do that. Try to imagine this. You step off a plane in the middle of nowhere. And my guide is nowhere to be found. Not a single soul knows who I am, why I'm there. The pilot just turns away, jumps back in the plane, and he's gone. Finally, the village elders recognize the situation and wave me over to a senior member where we all sit down in a hut and look at each other. This is Papua New Guinea. You're not in Kansas anymore, Scott Tucker. What am I going to do? How am I going to justify this whole thing? My mind is racing. After what seems like an eternity, Dixon, my guide, appears. Oh, because of the weather last night, yesterday, it, it's okay. I just made my way. Dixon profusely apologized for being late. Tried to explain that he had just spent the past two days hiking through heavy rains just to meet me. I was instantly reassured. I was going to be cared for. Somebody cared. Somebody was going to take care of me. Or at least that's what I thought. Within about an hour, I had depleted my water reserves. I was exhausted. My legs felt like anchors. I sweat through my first breathable shirt. Ticks the size of silver dollars. Oh my God, what have I done?
You were going uphill or you were going downhill. And when it flattened out, it was pure mud. Nothing was easy. I did a tremendous amount of research about the wildlife and the culture. All of it led to one thing. They've probably eaten much of what once was there. These people are sustenance farmers. Okay, yeah. yeah? Okay, as we go, um, you know, this uh, main track that, you know, people from there. Yeah? Yeah. Let's move, right? Yeah. So we're we going overnight. Now. Smoke. So, yeah, smoke up there, the valley. Up there. That's up on Oh the yeah yeah up. yeah yeah. Okay, that's the trees in between the trees smoke appearing. Nice. And that's where I slept last night. Ah. I walked through from five o'clock. We we took off. Five o'clock in the night with the light, little bit of light. Came thinking that I will reach first, but you made it first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We made it. We did. Nothing could have prepared me for the heat at the southern edge of the equator. It was a microwave oven. It seemed like an eternity, but we finally made it to the first location, the Amok tribe. The people are amazing, quite gracious, very kind. I'm exhausted. I'm going to be shocked if I get out of here alive. <laughs> I found my first home for the night. Damn next to seven and a half hours up and down Billy Goat trails. In the presence of the Lord, we say, you are welcome. What do you say? Here's the outhouse. Anybody home? How do you like that, huh? It's definitely a rat, you can tell, by the gallop. It's much more of a gallop than a little da -da 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 -da, like a mouse, you know. Plus I saw it, it was white. I could hear him long before. I finally did see him. No mosquito netting. Definitely heard some mosquitoes buzzing around me, threw some deed on, trying to make it through the night. Thank you. Thank you so much. You haven't lived until you shit in a pit. I have my hat. Yes, I will. Or slept with rats. Perhaps I am mentally ill. I love it. Thank you. Oh, look at how easy. Look at how much easier. <laughs> Much easier than me. If you're not going straight up a mountain or down a mountain, you're trying to not fall into a river. Thank you. Look at light Just for the record, I could do it, but I'm being polite. Okay. Dixon did the entire trip barefoot. They have feet like steel. Oh. <laughs> We're just about an hour in on the day two, and we cross this river, and then all of a sudden I look up, and there's this school where there had to be 150 children doing a morning prayer. It was something out of a movie set. Apinon is good afternoon in 
Papua New Guinea. Apinon. You don't. You do not say good morning in Papua New Guinea. You say morning, which I like. Just say morning. After eight hours of the most strenuous hiking I've ever done in my life, we arrive at the Simbai tribe. And it doesn't take long before I realize these guys were expecting me and they were about to put on a show. This was called a Sing Sing, aptly named, of course, as there was a lot of singing. I'm totally shocked at this point. All the tribal elders have gathered to greet me. Just me. I have no political or no other tribal connection. And as you can imagine, I'm exhausted after eight hours of vigorous hiking. I just want to lay down and pass out somewhere. My name is Patalomi. Patalomi, my name is Scott. 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 My name is Moses. Moses, my name is Scott. Nice to meet you. Deb, how are you doing? Name Rama. Rama. Nice to meet you. I'm Scott. John's father. My name is Joshua. Joshua. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Basil. Ask. Are these uh palms? Yes. And then these are cascas. Cascas. Yes. Do you eat cascas? Yes. We eat and teeth. Yes. Yes. Teeth. Yes. Finally, the greeting was over for now and they allowed me to go back up into my room to see this amazing villa that they had actually created for people like me. What? August and September are the dry season. That's when the Simbai tribe put on their huge sing-sings. I knew going in. I was here at the wrong time. Plus, I was a party of one. I had no true expectation that they were going to do this. Look at the trouble they went through to prepare for me. There are over 800 languages spoken in Papua New Guinea. I'm only visiting four villages. And after doing the research, I realized that the reason I'm in this region is because of an extended peace between these tribes. If you dig a little deeper, go a little further to the west, you'll find out there is war between certain tribes, even as we speak. At some point, it struck me, there's no need for a stereotypical job other than sustenance farming and hunting for the occasional ceremonial boar. There's no mortgages. You're born into the land you live on. No gasoline. They, they ain't got a car. 
fuel of any other sort. They burn wood and no need for medical benefits. Mother Nature got that covered. Basically, you're just sustaining yourselves in your community. But this amazing utopia lives in the shadow of an impending doom. It's loaded with natural resources, and as we speak, they're fracking. And the next thing you know, after a very short rest, I am invited to the official welcoming party. These men of the Kalam tribe were wearing headdresses adorned with thousands of green beetles that were captured and killed for the specific reason of making the headdress. Thousands and thousands of this one. Huh? They used the head of them. They used the head and got a strip of bamboo and then they net them up. Net them up and then make so many then and they made a crown and then they built this one out of it, out of this one. Ah, amazing. It's beautiful. It has got its own season. It starts from the month of March, April and goes finished. Every month in every year it comes on. So they fly around, they know what uh, things to attract them when so they come and feed on those. Things. But my guide Dixon explains, fewer and fewer of the young men are staying behind in the villages, getting lured away to the cities. So some of these traditions could be gone forever. We could be the last generation to even see this. My first hallucination came the second night. I didn't think I was going to make it again, so I started creating a story that it was raining too hard and the remainder of the trip was going to be too treacherous, the trails were going to be impassable. Earlier that day I had spotted a small airstrip. I started hatching a plan to contact my guide and just tell him, sorry, cancel the rest of it. Just put me on the next plane out of here. I'll head back home. Mama, 